Hey everybody, Michelle Wonder coming at you from Portland, Oregon. Um, you know, I don't think I've actually introduced myself to you all quite yet. I'll just say that uh, I'm a member of the Oregon Brew Crew and I come to organize here for the Women's International Beer Summit um, through my affiliation with She Brew in Portland, Oregon. So um, really great organizations I love being a part of. Um, but today we are here for the Propagating Knowledge session with Nina from Imperial Yeast. And by the way, Nina, I love that name. Um, great, great name for that <laughs> session. I really dig it. Tells you exactly what you're going to be expected to get. So I love that. Um, just a few particulars. I'm sure y'all have heard this a million times already this weekend, but we'll just get it real quick. You're muted. so You can't make too much noise. Everything's recorded, available right after it's done. You got that ask a question button down there. Pop a question in there. See questions you like. Vote them up. Um, leave comments, be kind, be loving, be generous to each other. And um, we will be posting, I'll be posting links if Nina like drops anything about, oh, this book that just changed my life and this group that I really love. I'll kind of be over in the background trying to find that and I'll pop that in the chat for y'all. And Nina, of course, you feel free to put any um, links or self-promotion you would like in the chat as well for folks. Um, if you have any connectivity issues, of course, the number one thing is to use Google Chrome, two, refresh your browser, three, hit pause, kind of let that buffer happen, hit play again. That will take care of most of your problems. Okay, guys, so I'm going to go ahead and take off my screen here, and I'm going to go bye-bye, and we're going to hear from Nina. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on and for the introduction, Michelle. Um, my name is Nina. I work with Imperial Yeast in Philadelphia. I am a sales and customer service lead out here. So for those of you who know Imperial, we're based in Portland, Oregon. But um, as of late 2020, we recently opened a spot out in Philadelphia. So we have a presence out here on the East Coast now. So what I am here to talk to you all today about is obviously yeast. And at this point in the summit, I know that you have heard from several really wonderful speakers on so many things pertaining to yeast from yeast selection, uh, fermentation mechanisms, interactions between yeast and other ingredients such as malt and hops, uh, recipe building, all really awesome, awesome information. And so I'm, I'm sure you've already gained a whole lot of new knowledge. So what I would like to spend this time with you all today is, first of all, I, I wanna touch on a bit of my journey uh, through the beer industry and really what brought me here to this moment in front of you all talking about yeast today. Second, I would really like to offer you all a framework for thinking and talking about yeast as part of your brewing process and more in like a holistic sense since there are so many ways that we can be talking about yeast when it comes to technical terms. You can get as technical of a deep dive as you want to in the world of yeast, and there's so much to know. But what I would like to do is be able to pull back that lens and look at it from a perspective that I think anyone on any scale, home brewing or commercial brewing, can really gain from um and have have a, like a holistic overview of how we can be thinking and talking about yeast every time we're brewing so obviously i'll leave some time for question and answer so if you have any burning yeast questions already feel free to drop them in the ask a question box and we'll get to them at the end if anything comes up during the same and michelle will be able to read them off to me and then we will wrap up towards the end. We did do a drawing for the year's worth of free yeast from Imperial. So stay tuned and we'll, we'll talk about that towards the end. So before we just go for the deep dive into yeast, I am gonna talk a bit about how I ended up in the beer industry in the first place. And for me, a story that's I'm sure resonates with so many of you. Um, 
For me, it started when I was 21 and an undergraduate at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, California. I was getting my degree in nutrition. And that year was the first time that I walked into a craft brewery. And maybe some of you would know it. Uh, it's called Central Coast Brewing. They're really excellent, still producing really wonderful beer. But my time there, I think meeting up with friends, if I'm being perfectly honest, the very first thing that I was just really into was the vibe of the whole place. Uh, people were enjoying themselves. They were drinking really great beer that deviated from my standard blue moon or shock top. I mean, I mean no disrespect for any of those beers, but um, it was a, a different caliber. And being able to hear the ways in that people were talking about their experience drinking beer was a whole new ball game for me. So I ended up approaching the bar manager there at the time who was working behind the bar and did my whole like, hey, so what's it gonna take for me to come in and work here? Like, how do I get a serving gig? And he, he kind of laughed, I'm sure, rolling his eyes internally because I wouldn't be surprised however many college students just came into that establishment on a daily basis and asked the same question. So he asked me, he's like, okay, great. Well, what do you know about beer? And I was like, well, I know nothing about beer. And that's the complete truth about it. And we, sh we shared a good laugh, but he did end up providing me like my first big tip off or my resource to push me more into beer education. And he said, if you're really serious about getting in here and learning about beer, I would recommend the beer server certification through the Cicerone program. So that's exactly what I did. I went home that night and I downloaded the whole syllabus and printed everything out and put it in a little binder. And I ended up carrying it around like with my college textbooks for a couple of weeks at least because it was so interesting. And I know this resonates with some of you as like that aha moment when it comes to beer, when you're able to have enough background knowledge about the process, the history, the science. There are just so many elements that are really appealing to just go for a deep dive and get lost in a lot of material. And that's initially what drew me in. So eventually, as this story goes, I think I was out one day at uh, at another brewery in town and I actually ran into this bar manager on his day off and he found me at a table by myself. I had two tasting flights in front of me and I had my syllabus out and I was taking a lot of notes and I was super into it. So I, I think he took that moment to heart. And so when I came back around and asked for a job again, he, he did give me a serving job. But that time at Central Coast Brewing was really my first foray, kind of the foot in the door for learning more about beer and ultimately fermentation. I spent a lot of time badgering the brewers and uh, offering to come in and help on packaging days and homebrewing, um, took up homebrewing with some friends. And as time went on, by the time I was about to graduate college, it was around the time when I realized that my interest in beer was definitely surpassing my interest in a career in dietetics, which was going to be the original plan. So I started thinking about ways in which I could shift gears a little bit and end up doing something in the beer industry. So for me, that came in the form of looking up places in the United States that have a really established beer scene, and I landed on Portland, Oregon. So summer of 2015, I 
packed up all, basically all of my personal belongings and put them in my Toyota Camry and drove up from central coast of California up to Portland, Oregon. And I didn't really have a plan. I, I really admire past Nina for this and the commitment of like beer or bust idea because I don't think I could bring myself around to do that again, but I really admire her. Good for her. But I didn't have a job lined up. I didn't know anyone. I didn't have a, I didn't have a place to live. I was just uh, like doing Airbnb and house sitting. And it was my intention to just really go around from brewery to brewery and sit at bars and talk to people and see who is hiring. So that brought me to actually base camp brewing in Portland, Oregon. I think they were sort of tickled in my interview and I rolled in as responding to their ad for, they were looking for a warehouse manager at the time. So um, I came in with my like Toyota Camry and tow full of stuff. And uh, I was like a five foot hundred pound person. I was like, yeah, I'm going to come in and push your pallets around. And they're like, great, come on in and do it. So that's what I did. I started at base camp in the warehouse, really pushing around pallets and uh, working in packaging. And that was kind of the first production based side of the industry that I was able to work in. And now at this point, I, I would like to pause and just acknowledge in this story that there is a huge lens of privilege about this kind of bootstrap in. I'm just making my way in through the industry. And that is just not accessible for every person who wants to be a part of this industry. And I can recognize that I am a white woman. I am cisgendered. I am able-bodied. I had the privilege of being able to pursue my passion career because I had a lot of fallback plan and a lot of safety net built in. I knew that I could rely on my parents for financial support if that's what I needed to do. I knew I could veer off in another career direction. And all of those things uh, made it a lot easier to face some of the barriers into the industry. So I would just like to call back um, that I think there is a responsibility for anyone who is a part of this industry to actively help dismantle those barriers for other folks who maybe have been historically excluded or underrepresented in this industry. It is so important that we take responsibility and accountability for breaking down those barriers and creating more opportunities to bring people in through education, through pay equity, um, through scholarships, and if you haven't already, please, please go check out. There was a really great discussion in the Equity in the Workplace channel earlier today. Um, Dr. J's conversation on Path to Freedom, all really great conversation. So um, a bit of a digression there, but back to my, base, my time at base camp really is when I was able to just move sideways into a bit more of brewing focus. Um, there was eventually a need for packaging, cellaring, and brewing, and that's really where I was able to dip my toes in and get some hands-on experience on a on a full-scale commercial production brewery. So when my time at base camp was up, I ended up moving over to Hopworks Urban Brewery, also in Portland, Oregon. And that was really where I really could dig into a lot of packaging, hot side brewing, uh, cellar work. When I left there, I was cellar manager. Um, it was a it was really like a fast paced environment and I was able to learn a lot and 
had a lot of community building in the process, which is something that I still deeply appreciate about this industry is that there's a lot of support and a lot of people trying to learn new things all the time. So when I was approached for a sales position at Imperial after having spent the previous years building up the resume and knowledge base in uh, like physical work production and seller management, it was really, it required like a, a pretty big shift for me to even entertain the idea of moving into supplier side. Like here I was having built a lot of knowledge and background and practical skill on the brewing side. And I honestly wasn't really quite sure if I would even like being in like sales and customer service. Um, but what ended up pushing me in that direction was it was a really great time for Imperial. For one, excellent group of people. Um, a lot of folks on the team that I had known and been friends with for a long time. Casey, I had worked with back at uh, base camp long ago. So we had gone way back. And it seemed like a really exciting time for Imperial since there was talk of building out the new production facility out in Philadelphia, which is where I am now. And it was really appealing just to have a bit of a change of pace. Um, and I was, I was really surprised when I moved over from the physical daily work of wort production and hot side and cellaring and my job now, which is wildly different, but there's some really cool things that I've been able to learn along the way. So in my pre COVID times, I spent a lot of time traveling and talking a lot with brewers and learning a lot about um, people's particular systems and what they're really trying to accomplish with their fermentations. And we work with folks who are in beer, in cider, in mead. Obviously, everyone has to have their seltzer on tap, so we get to learn a lot about that. So what's been really rewarding for me in this process is that even though I am not physically part of wort production on a day-to-day -day basis anymore. I feel strongly like I am part of the process with a lot of brewers making really great beers. And part of what we're doing on our customer service team for Imperial is making sure for one, that we're providing very high quality liquid yeast for brewers and then Secondly, connecting them with the resources that they need for performing successful fermentations in whatever they're doing. So I get to be, I get to have my hands in like everyone's fermentations now, which is super exciting. And on a more personal scale, what this opportunity has brought me is personally learning more and more about yeast literally every day. And for those of us in the industry, there's just so much that anybody could know about any particular aspect of this industry that we don't often have the opportunity present to go for a super deep dive and really specialize in one thing. So um, that's what we've been able to do with Imperial. We're just as an update for, uh, those are, of you who are invested in the Philadelphia production facility, we are open out here. It's been a really small, small team of us, and it's been a real push to get things online, but we're really excited to be out here. We just had our first successful production cook of some A38 juice that is coming out of tank, and we're really excited for the things to come. So. For homebrewers, um, expect to see pouches coming out of our facility later this year. We're still working on getting things in full force, but it's coming soon. So um, personally, something that I also wanted to touch on was I, I know that I've heard a lot of other speakers and questions from audience members 
on addressing some of the challenges that women especially face in this industry. And there are, it's completely valid. There are some really big barriers to overcome. There's obviously our own self-doubt and imposter syndrome. And then there's whatever else is projected onto us by other people, either within or outside of our industry. And for me, the biggest takeaway that has helped me in navigating that is really holding on to the perspective that everyone in this industry is constantly learning. And because it is so broad, there is just literally no way that anybody can know everything that there is to know about beer and brewing. And that's including the people who are going to cast doubt on your knowledge and skill. And part of that process for me is um, like during during COVID times, I've spent a lot of time in front of some virtual homebrew talks. Little plug here, if you are part of a homebrew club and you would like Imperial Yeast to come talk about yeast production and homebrew QC, hit me up, we'd love to do that. But I have spent a lot of time in front of a lot of people in many spaces where it's easy to feel like, ooh, people are not going to know think that I I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, But holding that recognition that it's, I know what I know, and I know that there's still a lot to learn. And that's, that's totally okay. And if anything, here's your permission for today to just appreciate wherever you are in your learning journey and to support yourself and others because we're we're all in it and we all want to make the best fermentation products possible. So I see you doing those things. So, so let's shift gears, gears here and we can talk about some yeast. So, as I mentioned in the beginning, there are just so many resources to take advantage of to whatever degree you want to go in the technical deep dive. And I will provide some of those resources for you towards the end of the presentation. But the following points that I'm going to get into are, they're intended more to guide your thinking about yeast and how it applies to fermentations. And a main takeaway that I would like to offer you all is that you don't need to know every single thing about yeast metabolism, um, how it's interacting with every ingredient in your beer. You don't have to be that technical to have success with your fermentations. If you want to go that route, excellent, do it up. Um, But what I want to be able to provide is a framework for thinking about it. So I don't have a presentation, but I do have this nifty whiteboard because I figured people might be a little bit PowerPoint fatigued at this point in the summit. So I'm going to write out a couple of takeaway terms that I'm going to touch on for each of these. And it's going to take me, of course too long to write things out in a legible way. That's okay. Everyone can have a sip of their beer while I'm doing that. All right. So I'm going to talk about yeast from the perspective of collaboration, consistency, and curiosity. And they all start with C's because I just really like memory mechanisms like that. So uh, first one we're going to talk about is collaboration. And I mean this in a couple of senses here. So the first one would be talking about collaboration with yeast itself. And what's important to note about this is yeast is different than your other major ingredients in beer. 
you've got your water, your hops, your malt, um, particularly malt and hops. Those are agricultural products. Yeast is a, a live living organism. And as an organism, it's got its entirely own goals that are completely separate from your own when it comes to brewing. So your yeast doesn't really care what ester profile you're trying to accomplish or what degree of attenuation you're looking for in your beer. Your yeast cares about eating, replicating, and then going to sleep, like hanging out, and then repeating that cycle. Honestly, that's all they, they actually really care about. So when I'm talking about collaboration, it is the responsibility as a brewer to, for one, respect the parameters of the yeast that you're working with, and then inviting those yeasts to collaborate by setting up the environment appropriately. And that can mean having very clear goals for what you're trying to accomplish with your fermentation. So questions you can ask yourself include, uh, what type of ester profile would I like in my beer? How much time do I have to produce my beer? Um, what kind of clarity am I expecting with my beer? And also recognizing what kind of equipment limitations you might be working with. So uh, temp temperature control when it comes to homebrewers, that's typically a big one. So a couple of different things to be thinking about when you're collaborating with your yeast. For one is temperature. Um, most strains, so your ale strains are typically, and you can look up with your yeast supplier, every every strain is stated what its ideal range for operation is going to be in. Um, for ales that generally lands in like the mid 60s to mid 70s degrees Fahrenheit. And a key point to remember is that the higher up you go on that scale, the more ester production or fruitiness you might pull from from that. So I'll draw, you know, I can draw this out. That's what the whiteboard is for. So we've got our ale temperature range, 65 to 75. Obviously on this end, you're gonna end up a little bit cleaner. You're obviously gonna start pushing some more ester profile on the upper end. But what you also just wanna be aware of is if you're trying to keep clean, you, you just don't generally want to be pushing much below um, what your stated temperature range is going to be. You don't wanna stress out the yeast in terms of having it too cold where they're going to struggle to get kicked off, um, struggle to ferment fully. You wanna keep them in an environment that they're going to be happy performing in. So for that, on that same note, when it comes to lagers, traditionally, if you saw a great lager top a uh, couple sessions ago, Bierstadt, also recommended. So typical lager strains might be fermenting in like lower or mid to higher 40s into the 50s. So let's say like 46 to 56 degrees Fahrenheit. So in these cases, you're not going to end up with too much ester production, but a little bit more the higher up you go. Um, it's also important to note if you are a home brewer without temperature control, you do have some options when it comes to producing the profile that you want from your beer. And if you're not able to keep your lager strain at 56 degrees Fahrenheit and it has to be warmer, that's totally fine. In fact, lager strains are going to be super happy at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And I think it's a common myth that it's like, oh, my lager yeast, I'm going to destroy it because it's it's too warm. That's actually where we propagate all of our yeast, like in the lab around the 70s. So um, if you are trying to temper that ester profile, you're able to use other variables. You can use pressure 
in order to reduce that ester profile and keep things clean. But keep in mind, we're paying attention to our yeast. We don't want to do anything that's going to um, be outside of its parameters. So temperature is one aspect of our collaboration. We can also look at things like attenuation. Attenuation, if you're looking online at your yeast suppliers recommendations, we have this posted on our website as a range, um, which is only part of the story when it comes to attenuation. So expecting your yeast to perform specifically within the parameters of the stated attenuation is not really the entire story. Um, a lot of influencing factors are going to come from places like your mash temperatures, your recipe composition, the diastatic power of your malts. All of those independently are variables that are going to impact your overall attenuation. It's not just the yeast itself performing that job. So understanding how each of those mechanisms and the enzymatic activity along with your um, your mash procedure and how that is making sugars available to your yeast, it's important to be considering. Another aspect to this collaboration is ensuring that you are selecting yeast that is in line with what you're desiring for flocculation characteristics. And I bring this up specifically because we will hear from brewers who are looking for uh, yeast for their hazy IPAs and they're like, I want this yeast to stay hazy. Well, this goes back, or this beer to stay hazy. Uh, this goes back to what we were talking about, expectations of our yeast and what our yeast would like to do. And yeast in general, once they do they, their job, they want to be dropping out of solution. They're not wanting to hang out and stay in your beer. So we have to be looking at other variables in that environment, whether it's going to be modifying your recipe, so you're adding some more oats or wheat, uh, whether you decide to implement techniques such as active fermentation dry hopping for that haze stability that you're going for. Those are gonna be considerations for the environment that you're going to be bringing your yeast into. Um, but we, we cannot put that entirely on the yeast. So those couple of things when it comes to collaborating with your yeast, uh, temperature, attenuation, and flocculation are just a couple of the things to be paying attention to. So let's return to the second component of our idea in collaboration, where if the first is with the yeast itself as an organism, the second is going to be with your supplier. And I say, when I say with your supplier, I mean me. You're going you're gonna to call me at Imperial if you have issues. And I do bring this up because unfortunately we do get those calls from brewers when they've already dumped a batch of beer. They say, I need a new pitch because something went wrong and I dumped it. I'm starting over from scratch. And I would strongly recommend reaching out to your supplier before you make that leap because we're here to really help in that process. Um, wherever you are, whether it's working with our strains in particular or really any fermentation, if you have questions, call your supplier and build that relationship. And if it's a, if it's a supplier worth working, with, then they're going to be able to provide really good resources for you and ensure that you feel set up for performing successful fermentations with the equipment that you have. So collaboration with your yeast and with your supplier. Those are the takeaways. 
So the second takeaway from this is going to be consistency. Yeast really likes it when you handle it consistently. And this is true whether you are handling your yeast for a one and done pitch. If you're a home brewer and you're buying a 200 billion cell yeast pack, if you're a professional brewer and you're getting a commercial pitch, um, we always recommend for one, storing cold is going to be of utmost importance to your yeast health. So storing cold is exactly as it sounds. It's keeping your yeast cold until it's ready to pitch. And the reason why we recommend this is once your yeast is exposed to different temperature fluctuations, um, yeast wants to be active at warmer temperatures. And if it does not have access to appropriate nutrients or sugar, it's not gonna be super happy. It's gonna be stressed out and really not ready to perform in your batch. So storing cold, if you're getting something, um, if you're a home brewer shipping your yeast from a supplier or retailer online, make sure that you're always shipping with a yeast pouch or with, a, with an ice pack. When you receive it, make sure that it goes in your fridge and it stays there until you're ready to pitch. Same on the commercial side, as cold as you can store your yeast, whether you're using it a single time or if you are going to be harvesting and repitching, make sure that you're storing it cold for the entirety. So beyond storing cold, consistency also is important when it comes to pitch rates. And if you've ever talked to anybody at Imperial Yeast, we are going to hammer it into your heads that pitch rate is of utmost importance when it comes to producing really great beer. So uh, pitch rate, what we're targeting with for ales in general is going to be targeting that 0.75 million cells per mil per degree Play-Doh. Loggers are going to be going for at least one and a half million cells per mil per degree Play-Doh. And these are industry accepted pitch rates. If you're a five gallon batch home brewer, um, you can typically hit that with 200 billion cells in a pack. But your, your pitch rate is going to be a huge determining factor when it comes to um, short lag times, quick healthy fermentations, ensuring that you're not going to develop any sort of yeast stress related off flavors in your finished product. Um, beyond your pitch rate, we're also looking into aeration and nutrition. So aeration for most strains, we're looking at hitting around like 12 to 15 ppm. Um, if you are a commercial brewer with a regulator that reads in liters per minute, that's gonna be ideal. So targeting like two to three LPM on the lower end. For some strains you're going to be working with, those needs are going to change. Um, if you're working with higher gravity brews, obviously that's a time to be examining what your pitch rate is. You would want to be pitching more yeast than you would with your standard gravity beer. Um, for aeration, you might be needing a little bit more aeration for some of those higher gravity brews. But on that same note, uh, working with some strains, it depends on the strain that you have in front of you. If you're working with like a Hefeweizen strain or as we would call it like a GO1 Stefan, you can play around with some pitch rate a little bit. You can go for a 50% pitch rate and target half of what you would with a standard ale fermentation. If you want to be pushing more of like a banana ester profile in your product, but 
that's when it comes around to with making sure that you have really established goals and understanding when you're selecting those yeasts, how, how each of those variables and what they're going to bring to your fermentation are going to work with you. And you have to treat your yeast consistently. If you're someone who's harvesting and repitching, um, the most ideal scenario is that you do have a setup where you can do some cell counting and check into viability when you're repitching into your next batch. But if you don't have those capabilities, that's okay too. We do recommend pitching by weight instead of by volume. Um, that will be able to yield the most consistent results from generation to generation. And it'll keep your yeast happier as well. So finally, we've got in our takeaway, curiosity. So inevitably, despite all of our best efforts, things in our fermentations are not always going to go as planned. And especially for some of us as production brewers or people who brew regularly enough where we're feeling really confident in our practices and we rely a lot on intuition. It can be a part of a lot of brewing mentalities that it's like, I got this, I do this the same way every single time. So when things do go wrong, it can be really jarring and it can lead you to say like, okay, uh, my beer has stalled out, something must be wrong with my yeast. And in those moments, I would invite you to meet that process of thinking with some curiosity. And the questions that you can ask yourself are, what exactly am I observing? And what tools do I have to help quantify and troubleshoot those observations? This is a really great time to call your supplier and invite them in for this process of questioning. So one of those things that we're always going to be asking you if you call us is, uh, Take a gravity. Do you have a current gravity? And that's going to be the best indicator of what's going on with your beard. Um, it's usually not a sufficient basis for us if someone calls in and says, I don't see any bubbles in my airlock or in my blow off. It's like, okay, that's an indicator that something might be going not as expected, but we do have to be working with the tools that we have. And one of those is gravity. Um, I do want to refer to another presentation that I think is a really great story. If you're able to check out one of the brew talks with Kat from yesterday, she had a really great story about troubleshooting and how it's not always the most obvious answer. Um, I'll let her tell the story when you go look at that segment. But the takeaway there was that she had a beer that stalled out and she was trying to get it started up again by adding some more yeast. It wasn't until the end when she was cleaning the tank that she had discovered that a glycol solenoid valve had been left open. And for almost the entirety of her fermentation time, that beer was at cold, crashed temperatures. So the yeast never really had an opportunity to really go to work and ferment fully because of those temperatures. And the takeaway for me with that story is that when there is troubleshooting and we do have all of these tools to be looking at, um, it can also come down to calibration of your equipment. So ensuring that your pH meters are regularly calibrated, your temperature probes in your mash tun in your fermenters, um, just making that part of a regular process in your, in your brew house is going to be really important to making sure that things stay consistent and that you're able to troubleshoot and ask those questions when things go not as planned. Um, and there's plenty of 
of ways to build your arsenal for testing. Uh, we've got VDK testing for diastole. You can perform force ferments to monitor where your fermentations can be expected to, to end up. There, there's so many tools and if it's overwhelming, definitely call your supplier and we can help walk you through some of them. So um, each of these variables that we just talked about, collaboration, consistency, and curiosity, those are all to help deepen your understanding of the variables that are affecting your fermentation. And if you are one of those people who does need to go for the deep dive into some more info, I do really recommend this book right here. You can see it is well loved and like dog eared in so many places. Um, part of the Brewing Elements series, Yeast, the Practical Guide to Beer Fermentation. It is really excellent for folks, even on a homebrew scale, a lot of these tests for building out your own yeast lab are really applicable to doing at home. Um, force ferment tests, like I was just describing, diacetyl force, those are really useful tools when it comes to your at home. Or if you're looking to start up a lab in your commercial brewery. Um, beyond this book, there was a recommendation made to me. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, one of our tech support leads, Jess, recommends this book. Can probably drop it in the chat here in a few, but it's called Brewing Yeast and Fermentation. It's by Chris Bolton and David Quain. And it's really just a bit of a deeper dive if you've already breezed through this Bible here and you need to go for a deeper dive into some of the more technical elements of yeast metabolism, that's going to be a best resource to do so. So I would love to take the opportunity to open it up to some questions. I can see that there are some and maybe Michelle can help navigate them with me. Are you muted, Michelle? Am I the only one who can't hear? I lose you. I might have to refresh. We've had a lot of tech technical issues today. <laughs> I'll look for your text, Michelle. Um, but I do, have, I can read some questions here from the ask a question box. Um, the top one here is a great one. It is, what is Imperial? Oh, wow, it just moved on me. Oh my gosh. I think many homebrewers worry they won't know if their yeast is dead. How do you know if it's done done or just sleeping? Um, I think for that question, uh, I think I would want some elaboration on if you're worried about your yeast is dead for like before pitching or actually in your beer. Um, I wouldn't be too concerned about your yeast being dead if you have a fresh pouch. So if it's from Imperial, uh, we recommend using a pouch of yeast that is within four months of its manufacturing date. And that is generally going to be fresh enough where you don't have to worry about too much viability loss. Um, if you are worried about it in your fermentation, the best indicator of what's going to be going on with your yeast is by taking a gravity reading. So when you're observing your fermentations, um, if you're looking in your airlock for any sort of activity, that's going to be a great indicator of what's going on. But uh, I think your best tool in that case is going to be taking a gravity reading. And if you're not seeing any activity where you're expecting it to be happening, um, give us a call and we can help navigate that. I hope that helped. I'm back up here. I think you guys can hear me now. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. 
Okay, great. Thanks for taking the helm there. Appreciate that. Yeah. Good answer to that question. So next one up, uh, can you mix two strains when you're pitching yeast? Yes, absolutely. And it's encouraged in a, in a lot of cases. For Imperial, we have a couple of uh, blends that we work with regularly that does take several strains for the qualities that we do like about them. One that comes to mind is our blend A24 Dry Hop. It is a blend of AO4 Barbarian, which is uh, often referred to as the Conan strain, and it's 50% A20 Citrus, which is often referred to as the Sactois strain. Um, together, those two strains just have like a powerhouse profile that is perfect for really hot forward beers. Um, so we get like a really beautiful stone fruit ester profile from Barbarian. And then A20 Citrus is going to be a little bit drier and kind of helps with the attenuation aspect of that fermentation. So highly recommended. Feel free to experiment with different strains and let us know what you come up with too. That's a huge part of our R&D process is um, seeing what strains are going to work well together. One thing to consider if you are harvesting and repitching using multiple strains, you are going to end up with a shifted ratio of those strains over time when you're harvesting. Um, generally, you're going to have, if you have a strain that has more flocculent characteristics, you might be pulling a little bit more of that strain into future generations using that blend. So just a consideration. Great. Awesome. Yeah, I've done that many a time too. I've just been like, oh no, I think my gravity's higher than I thought. I need another bag. Oh, I got this on hand. Put you. <laughs> or here's some dry yeast. Sprinkle <laughs> it on top, you know? Yep. Yep. It does mm -hmm. its job. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Let's get to the next one here. We got about four or five more questions for you. We got some time, so no pressure there. Um, can you over pitch a low gravity beer? Yeah, you, you certainly can. Um, it's gonna, so the implications with under pitching a beer are going to be, the repercussions with under pitching are so much greater than they are with over pitching. I'm assuming that you're talking about a homebrew scale. And in that case, it can be pretty difficult to over pitch in ways that are going to have a negative impact on your fermentation. Um, where over pitching can really be a concern is if you're consistently going up over for future generations, um, it can lead to some issues with viability. But if you're, if you're brewing a three gallon batch and you have a pouch that's sized for five gallons and it's a lower gravity beer, it's going to be okay to pitch what you have on hand. Um, in any case, you might have a couple of extra days of cleanup time to just let some of those compounds that are produced during fermentation be reabsorbed and metabolized so they don't end up in your finished product. But I, I don't see too many impacts with um, some standard over pitching for a lower gravity beer. Great, excellent. All right, next question up here. Uh, what is Imperial's R&D process when coming up with new strains? Yeah, that's a great question. And we have a whole dedicated team actually to R&D. And on site at our Portland facility, uh, we do have like a, a glorified homebrew system that really anybody is able to, to trial strains on. So. In our bank at Imperial, we have well over 200 strains that we're banking that we've acquired. And it's R&D's job to go through and um, put some of those strains to work and brew some beers with them, see how they turn out, see how they perform under a variety of conditions when it comes to temperature, pitch rate, uh, pressure, pH. There are so many ways that we can be looking at any particular strain. Um, 
And it really eventually what's great about working with yeast is because it's not an agricultural product, we can respond really quickly to what people want to see. And I think we saw that with Kvike strains when those became really popular and people wanted to be using Kvike for a lot of experimentations. We were able to go into our bank and retrieve some that we wanted to play around with and see uh, see what could really fit the bill if we're trying to produce something that is going to be able to be applied to a lot of different applications. Um, it's pretty pretty involved process. But if you ever have ideas, come come badger us about what you would like to see in terms of yeast. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I now have a new dream job that I want. R and D <laughs> brewer at Imperial Yeast. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Like, let me play with your yeast. Let me play with I've seen your guys' system too out on the big mm-hmm. brew days that you host. Um, and it's totally a great little little system there. So that would be a fun job. All it's right, dreamy. mark that one. <laughs> Here's a fun one. You know, during lockdown, we all got into uh, making bread, and bread yeast was hard to come by. So we've got a question here. Can you use imperial yeast in bread making? I personally haven't. Um, I feel like I'm not the most equipped person on our team to respond to that, because I want to say that a couple of people have tried to make bread using our yeast and uh i mean the answer is you you can i'm sure it's a great experience you're not going to obviously get the same kind of profiles in the same way that you will in your fermented beverage but go for it and let us know how it turns out because i'm curious yeah i just think it would make for a much more expensive loaf of bread most likely because bread yeast yeah. is pretty cheap for a little teaspoon right that you use exactly. in there. but uh, if you happen <laughs> to have it on hand i think it sure. could be a good thing to do yeah all right great a uh, couple more here and then we'll hand everyone over into our closing giveaway session for the day um do you have a yeast strain you said oh let me start answering that limo i'll repeat the question my apologies do you have a yeast strain you suggest for seltzer fermentation that can better handle the osmotic pressure of the sugars and low nutrients that also flocculates flocculates well for a more clear final product? The big oh, question today. Yeah, the seltzer question. So for uh, for winter, we did have a seasonal offering called W04 Paramount. It's a specialized wine strain that is actually really perfect for seltzer fermentations because it is, um, it's tolerant to a lot of different conditions. It ends up pretty dry. It has a really neutral profile. Um, If there might still be some kicking around, but I know it's on the way out. We are experimenting with a lot more gluten-free offerings, um, Mm. but that W04 Paramount is, would be your best option for a seltzer. And it's always important to note if you are doing seltzer fermentations to ensure that you have proper nutrients in order to support those fermentations. Um, Definitely fan is a consideration, obviously something with zinc, um, but you gotta, gotta replace what would otherwise be offered in wort fermentations. Sounds right to me. Okay, let's go for the last couple ones here. I don't transfer to secondary. How long can I leave my beer in primary before I st- start to get off flavors from yeast, autolysis, etc.? Ideally, you want to take your beer off of your yeast really as soon as you've completed your primary fermentation and your diacetyl rest. Uh, you're not really gaining a whole lot from your yeast sitting in contact with your beer for an extended period of time. And by allowing it to sit at fermentation temperatures, you're, you run the risk of what you mentioned for yeast autolysis, um, definitely decline viability if you're harvesting and repitching for future generations. If you must leave it, it's, if, you're not able to start racking it off or bottling it right away. Um, at least getting it cold will will help with that process. Awesome. 
All right, and our very last one, it's much more technical. What is the ration by weight for harvesting and repitching to Plato of Warts or pitch to Plato of Wart? Mm. Um, we can, if, if you want to reach out to me indirectly and we can kind of dig into what the recommendations might look like, we do have a standard recommendation of typically if you're working on a homebrew scale, you can pull about 200 to 300 grams worth of yeast and that's pitchable into five gallons of wort. Um, but I guess I would want to know if you're working with an ale, a lager, what the gravity was going to look like, and we can dial it in from there. So cool. I guess that's a good mention. I can drop my email address in the chat and anybody is welcome to reach out to me with questions. Yeah, that would be wonderful. We would appreciate that. I know uh, Casey has always been, I've had Casey's email and she's always super responsive. I've called her before like, oh my God, my fermentation ramped up to 90 somehow. What do I do? And she's like, take a deep breath. We'll figure this out. Yep. And she always helps walk me through it. It's amazing. So yeah. you guys are a wonderful, lucky to me, local here for, in, for me in Portland. But I know you guys give the same great service to all the home brewers and all the commercial brewers around. So we, we thank you so much for being here today. Would you like to get to the uh, announcement of the winner? Yes, I would like to share who the winner of a free year's worth of Imperial is. And that is Valerie of Redondo Beach. So congrats, Valerie. It sounds like you're going to get an email with some more information and we'll be in touch on how you can cash in on your price. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we didn't have Valerie's last name, but we know she's in Redondo Beach and we do have her email. So we will get you guys in touch with each other so you guys can get that sorted out. That's an amazing prize. That's going to motivate, I'm sure, someone to brew a lot more this year than they may have anticipated. So that's wonderful. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Imperial. Thank you to all the wonderful attendees. Um, we are switching over a little bit of a technical hiccup again here at the end of the day. So our grandfather giveaway, our BS, our home brew con giveaway and the summit goodbye are all going to happen on the very last session there, the summit goodbye session. So head over there after you're done here and we'll be talking with BSG. We'll be talking with the AHA and the WIBS team will be coming on to do a cheers and send the summit off in style. So thank you again. We'll probably see you over there, Nina. Thanks again for attending. Appreciate you all. Thank you. All right. Bye guys. Thanks.